out every every time. He... Well, tonight is uh, Slider and Verlander going at it. So, uh, yeah. with the broadcasters being Chipper Jones, John Smoltz, Tom Glavin, and Frank Coor. So that All I'm the recording. other 1990s Braves. Yeah, <laughs> that, that could, that's going to be hilarious. So, <laughs> all right. Well, folks, I'm going to ask everybody to mute themselves, if you could. The lower left-hand corner of, of your screen should be a mute button there. And that, would, that would be fantastic. And let me go ahead and share my screen, my friends. Okay. Well, folks, uh, get, welcome to, uh, to the last lecture here uh, for the Chickamauga and Chattanooga Civil War Roundtable for the 2022 and 2023 season. Uh, very honored to have you join us here this evening, folks. Uh, glad to have you with us here and and uh, for our June presentation. Uh, our next battlefield tour, well, really technically, is next Saturday with uh, Brad Quinlan. Uh, we're going to start at 9 o'clock at the Marietta National Cemetery. We'll hit the Confederate Cemetery after that. Uh, then we'll do lunch. And then in the afternoon, uh, we're going to hit Cole's Farm and Kennesaw Mountain. Made the adjustments because, as many of you know, that I put out, uh, Kansas State University has a, has an event in the morning from 9:30 to 12:30, and some of the folks wanted to attend that. So you can still go to the both. You can attend the KSU event and then link up link up with us after lunch uh, for the full afternoon tours of the farm in Kennesaw Mountain. So uh, Brad has been very flexible, and I appreciate uh, his flexibility on that. To be able to do so, but that's going to be good. Rain or shine, we're going to be doing it. Uh, on Saturday. At least our our dear friend Lee White is going to be giving a talk on Sam Watkins at eleven o'clock at the uh, at the Chickamauga Military Park. I think it's going to be a caravan, if I'm not mistaken. That's bound to be pretty good. Uh, but in May of next year, uh, we have author historian Tim Smith in the Battle of Shiloh. Uh, and that's that's going to be great. More information to follow on that. And if, if you're not a member, my friends, of, of our roundtable, see there at the bottom our rolling dues, uh, $45 for singles, 60 for families, 15 for students. Can, can pay a, uh, a variety of means, uh, whatever uh, best suits your, uh, what's best for you. Uh, just shoot me a note. I would certainly love to have you have you join us. This is our current uh, bank and Bank statement here, folks, just under 16, uh, 1.6 uh, thousand. And uh, we'll do $250 for Brad Quinn for his tour, but uh, we're still in good shape, uh, you know, for, for next season. <clears throat> and uh, again, a shout out for the Longstreet Society uh, there in Gainesville, Georgia, uh, for their seminar in October with a focus on Second Manassas. Uh, that's, that's bound to be another good one. And our, of course, our, uh, our speakers that we've had, uh, this season, I think it's been a great year, really dynamic speakers, uh, with, with wonderful topics. Uh, I think, uh, you all have, have enjoyed those and they're very illuminating for sure. And, uh, of course, Tom Eichen is, uh, our last speaker tonight. Uh, but next, next year, folks, starting in September, our, our good friend, Dr. Jennifer Murray, is back with us. Uh, she, I've spoken to her a few times. She is not; uh, Her book is not finished on Mead yet, uh, but she will be joining us uh, talking about uh, about Mead in general, uh, her work so far. So we are absolutely thrilled to have her back to start off our season in September. Uh, Dr. Kenneth No, The Howling Storm, a book that certainly attracted a lot of attention over the last couple of years, and we're really glad to have him with this and you can see the rest of our, our speakers, uh, a, div a diverse, a really set of subjects I think we have for next season. And we're going to finish off a year from uh, this month with a combined presentation by Dave Powell and Eric Wittenberg on their book, award-winning book, uh, The Tullahoma Campaign. That is, uh, so that's our lineup. Hold on just a sec. And these are the books that uh, sort of relate to, to the speakers there. Sarah K. Uh, Biley, we're talking about the Battle of Newmarket. Uh, we have uh, a presentation on William Tecumseh Sherman there in the Civil War. Scott Mangus, Texans at the Battle of Chickamauga. And uh, the Three-Cornered War, uh, Megan Kate Nelson there in the lower left-hand 
corner of the slide. I've, I've heard a lot about this book right here that is a fantastic presentation. So look forward to that. Uh, Robert Plum's uh, Five Women Who Changed Civil War America. Bound to be interesting. And so, uh, let me, you can see that right there. Let me throw that up there. So that's the, uh, this is actually the, what they're going to be talking about uh, starting in September. Uh, right now we have December open, but we will fill that. Uh, but again, I think we have a wide range of, of subjects and, you know, sneaking a little bit into the far west with New Mexico and um, the three corner war, uh, Megan Kate Nelson's presentation in April. So uh, maybe some areas that you've not uh, maybe familiar with, uh, I think will be very good. So I will stop sharing my slide. Well, folks, we are very happy to have with us tonight. Tom Eichen uh, holds a bachelor's degree in secondary education, and social studies. Uh, with an emphasis on U.S. history from Indiana State University at Fort Wayne. He's a member of the Gettysburg Foundation, the American Battlefield Trust, and Sons of Union Veterans, the Civil War. He has a Facebook page and an Instagram page. And his website, TommyEishen.com, has an extensive collection of his uh, modern photographs of Gettysburg. Uh, and uh, like I said, I've seen a few, and they're really, really quite dynamic. So, so, Tom, with that, sir, if you want to share your slide, and I will turn it over to you, my friend. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Yes, sir. There we go. Um, so if you go to TommyEishen.com, you will not find any Gettysburg pictures. Um, my wife and I moved from Houston, Texas uh, on May 5th to Fort Wayne, Indiana, and it took us a bit longer than expected. When I got here, I had some problems. Uh, my wife was in the hospital for 19 days and then we got to Fort Wayne and she went back in the hospital. So for somehow, some reason, I've had some issues with some of the photos, but Lightroom is working. And so the photos that I have to present tonight should be able to go through without too much problems. Um, this is Saks Bridge. And it's a bridge that was used on the first day at Gettysburg by both armies because troops were coming from all over the place. And both um, both armies use this bridge. So I, every photographer has a style. Um, I started taking pictures in 1973, and through the years, I developed my own little bit of a style. I like pictures that are a little bit underexposed. Um, I like to boost up um, the colors a little bit, and I look for a little bit of a little jump in contrast. Uh, modern camera. I started with a manual camera. There was a light meter. You adjust the aperture and the shutter speed to bring a line with a circle to match up that light meter and you get a good picture. Any more of the, the cameras that you use today are more computer than they are cameras. And instead of a dark room, I have light room. Uh, just, it's a wonderful program to be able to go in and make adjustments. Um, you will not find any people in my photographs. Because like at Gettysburg, when the battle is going on, I kill people. I just take them out of my pictures. Uh, Lightroom and Photoshop make that easy to do. So let's just go through. If you have any questions about any of them, please ask. And we'll see what we can come up with. Um, this house is called the First Shot House. Uh, it was lived in by Ibrahim Weisler. And I am going to mispronounce names. I am horrible at mispronouncing names. I think it stems back that most people can't pronounce my last name, spelled E-I-S-H-E-N. I've been called all kinds of things. So if I butcher names, just bear with me. Um, when I first came to Gettysburg and found this house in the early 90s, uh, it was all painted white. The Park Service recently restored the house, and I think they did an amazing job. And I don't think they've done the inside yet, but they've restored the outside and uh there's the monument that was put up one of the early monuments put up um criminates the first one of the claimed first shots at gettysburg now in 1863 this was farmland and the only woods you had was the woods that were in uh called managed woodlots so the trees you see are not historical, but they, can't, but they can't go back and just start chopping trees down all over the battlefield or in private land because this is a little bit of segment um, in front of the park, and this is the only park land is right here at the house. Uh, this is John Buford's monument. As you get 
near McPherson's barn coming down the cash down pike into Gettysburg. Uh, in the background, that white ob uh, object you see uh, is the Peace Memorial that was dedicated in 1939. And uh, Franklin Roosevelt was there. And that's on Oak Hill. Uh, the tree line you see running across here is where one of the uh, sections of the unfinished railroad uh, track is. And the track is finished now. And some trees do grow up along the railroad track. Whoops. Uh, this is also John Buford. Uh, Buford's statue is a wonderful statue to use sunsets and sunrises with. And this happens to be a sunrise over Gettysburg. And I like shooting silhouettes. Um, I started young with manual camera, learning how to use the camera to adjust, to darken out the fore foregrounds and get the most out of the light in the backgrounds. A lot of modern cameras, especially on your cell phones, they try to balance out the light. And I'm not looking for balanced light. I'm looking for dark blacks and then boost in the colors of the night. Night. In, well, it's almost night. Sunrise and sunsets. And right behind Buford is John Reynolds. John Reynolds did not get to this part of the battlefield, but I guess they decided since they put Buford there, they put Reynolds behind him. I do not know the story behind it. Um, but the battlefield changes based on season. Uh, obviously, th this was late fall, or I don't remember exactly. Oh, it was spring, sorry. If you look up at the top, you see 4 3 2019 tells you when I took the photograph. This is the image size. So this is a large scale image. It's very, can be blown up very big. And then that tree really, really brings out the colors of the fall. And you can see a little bit of the bridge here that goes across the railroad track. Um, that's now part of the, bat, the park road across there. Sorry, I had a mosquito buzzed me. And the tree is not there anymore. I'm not sure whether they took it down because it was non-historic or it died, but next time I went, the tree is gone. There's stories about how many feet are on the ground for horses where the officer was killed or wounded, and every, all the research I've done saying that that's just not true. That's just a myth. This is all, also Reynolds at sunrise. So with my camera and a lot of cameras these days, you can flop the camera over to black and white. In the old days, you shot black and white, you had black and white, shot color, that's all you had, that's the type of film you're using. With digital, though, is the flip of the switch on the camera, or in this case, in the computer with Lightroom. I had an image that the colors were not really that good. There wasn't much I could do with it. So I just flipped it into black and white. Uh, just like the dramatic color, the dramatic feel and texture of the sky, didn't want to lose it. Um, this little building over here on the left, uh, that's a little ranger station. There's a restroom there, and race, restrooms on the battlefield are a premium. And uh, they used to have, uh, you could get tours of the battlefield through there and they'd have the licensed guides hang out, but I'm not sure they do that much anymore. I haven't caught a licensed guide there in, a, in several years. Um, this is one of the, the monuments uh, right near McPherson's barn. And, you know, you can use the sky and use the, the light to your advantage. In this case, I was going for, you know, with the eyes especially, you know, darkness in the eyes and then brightness in one. Uh, this was one of the bucktail regiments. You can barely see it, the bucktail hanging uh, off his cap. This is an unfinished railroad uh, track. I put this up on one of the Facebook groups and I quickly got told I was breaking the law because it is illegal to get down on the railroad tracks. They don't run trains through the battlefield that often. It is a working track, um, but I just couldn't pass uh, the opportunity. Um, the two monuments here, this one is to one of the Iron Brigade monuments and this is one of uh, Cutler's uh, regiments. The monuments at Gettysburg are placed where the regiment first went into battle. And these regiments were held in reserve. 
and they did take take care take part of the fight with Davis's uh, brigade in the morning on the first day, and they helped capture a lot of the Confederate troops that got down into the railroad cut. So the, this rule was set up um, when Virginia decided they wanted to put up a state monument just a few feet from the stone wall on Cemetery Ridge, where at the end of Pickett's Charge, you might have heard the high tide of the Confederacy happen. And the Batt Gettysburg Battlefield Commission, which was run by Union officers, decided that that wasn't really going to work. So they made the rule that you had to put your monuments where the regiment went into the line of battle. And for Confederates, that puts them a long way away from any of the fighting at Gettysburg. Now, there's been a few exceptions uh, on Pickett's Charge. The, 100, uh, the 11th Mississippi and 24th North Carolina has small monuments up where near the wall to show how far they got in Pickett's Charge. But other than that, the rule pretty much stands. Uh, and this is Oak Hill, and this is the Peace Memorial, and uh, it has an eternal light. The gas flame burns all the time, rain or shine, uh, 365 days a year. It also is a good spot for sunrises. That's the sunrise and sunsets, especially with the sunrise and sunsets gets you an opportunity to capture a little bit more of the flame. Uh, this monument is to, sorry, I think it's, yeah, I forgot which regiment, sorry, sorry, oh, 90th Pennsylvania, I do that right now, uh, can't help to see the birds, um, these are doves, at the dedication of the monument, Colonel Sellers, uh, the regiment's commander, wrote, the war is over, the dove which brought the glad tidings of a regenerated world here is used to symbolize the era of peace and goodwill between men man and men so there was a story um i heard one of the licensed guide tell how the regiment there was a tree nearby and the dove's nest fell from the tree and they put it back up and that's just one of the stories licensed guides are wonderful at gettysburg but every once in a while they'll get caught up in in a myth and they'll repeat a story that's not quite accurate. Uh, this 12th Massachusetts Volunteers. Uh, the main reason I put this here is to give you an example of how the battlefields changed over the year. Years. 2005, this is what it looked like. Uh, it was set back in the trees, uh, but that's not... Sorry about that. That's not the way it was in 1863. Uh, this photo more captures the way it is currently and the way it was in 1863. They just came in and where there were not historical trees, they took the trees out. Uh, where there were missing trees, they planted some. And they did that with a lot of orchards. Uh, I'll show you a little later, the famous peach orchard has been greatly expanded, double in size from what it was when I first started visiting Gettysburg in the 18, 1980s. This monument is to... The 88th Pennsylvania, uh, this, I just love this shot, um, the way the eagle is looking out towards the sunset. And Iverson's brigade, if you remember the story about it, they came up towards the stone wall that was here, and they didn't expect the Union troops from the 1st Corps, 2nd Division was down behind the wall. They didn't realize they were there. Iverson's men got pretty close. They raised up and fired and took out the first rank of Iverson's brigade. A lot of the men went into a low portion. You can see how down in here, it's a little bit low ground. And then the 88th um, Pennsylvania went out and captured a lot of men. Uh, that didn't really last very long because they, they captured them, but pretty soon the 88th with the rest of the first corps was in a, in a retreat. There are a lot of dogs on monuments at Gettysburg. This is Sally. Uh, she was killed at the Battle of Harcher's Run in 1865. So she made it almost through the war. Um, not quite. And I just happened to catch the moon where it was. I do have the ability to move the moon around, um, but I didn't have to in this case. It just, I 
like the placement of it. This is Barlow's Mull, no, uh, it's Francis Barlow. He was commander of a brigade. Uh, they had the right flank on the first day at Gettysburg. His brigade was overrun. Barlow was critically injured and left for dead. Uh, he was captured by the Confederates, and they left him behind when they retreated, uh, expecting him not to live, but he did survive. Uh, I'm not that interested with the activities that happens on Barlow's Knoll, but I like the sunsets there. And uh, depends on the season. Um, the best sunsets for photography are the ones where there's clouds. Clouds give you texture, they give you a lot more color. Um, cloud, when it's a, just a clear sky, it just sun goes down, there's no residual color. And for photographer anyways, it's just not as exciting as having clouds. This is also Barlow. See, on this one, I'm catching it just before the sunset. Get a little bit of color from the blues to the yellows, but I, I like the clouds a lot better. And the bugler sounding at sunset. And sometimes when you take a photograph, you think you got a really good one. You can just change position a little bit. And if you watch the sky, just a little bit of a change of direction and a little bit of change of the width of the photo going from a more of a zoom to a wide angle just changes the entire mood of, of the shot. And this was say, taken the same night. And no matter how many times you go back to a place, if the clouds are different, the sky is going to be different. The light's going to be different. You can just take them and just have never have a repeat in a, in a sunset or a sunrise. Uh, this is Thompson House. Mrs. Thompson uh, was living here at the time. Thaddeus Stevens owned the house. He rented it to her. And this was General Lee's headquarters. Well, this is General Lee's headquarters as I saw it when I first got Gettysburg first time in 1986. Uh, this one was taken about 2009. Um, you've seen any photos taken by Matthew Brady at the time. This is not how it looked like. Uh, there was a hotel that circled around the, the house that was basically in the hotel's parking lot, but not today. The Battlefield Preservation Trust raised enough money to buy the hotel. They closed it down, shut it down, and they restored the house back to the look of 1863. So General Lee's headquarters looks very much as it did at the time of the battle. This is North Carolina Memorial. Uh, all the state memorials for the Confederacy are back on uh, West Confederate Avenue, and this is on Seminary Ridge. And I use this one because the lighting can change. These are the figures in the, the monuments, main part of the monument, if you see over to the right. And you can see how the, the light is with this one. And if you look at a little bit warmer, uh, this is earlier in the morning, you just get a more dramatic effect with the color. Uh, there's called the golden hour of photography for landscape photographers. Late in the afternoon, about after five o'clock or early in the morning uh, before 8.30, 9 o'clock, depending on, on the season, you get the more of a yellow tone and more of a cast to the photos. This is Virginia Memorial. This is not the design they were going to put up on Seminary Ridge. They changed the design, and this was the one that was finally approved. And this is also taken during the golden hour, and you get the, the colors. And this all monument is also good for sunrises, not so much for the sunsets with all the trees behind it, it but it, it works for a sunrise. This is Mississippi Memorial. Um, if you look in the background, the house there is Brian House and Barn. Uh, that, that was owned by a freed slave. Mr. Brian got the heck out of there when the Confederates came. Uh, the hill behind is Cemetery Hill. This monument and the Louisiana monument that's nearby were both done by the same artist. And in the morning, 
when you're in the golden hour, the, the colors of the Mayama just really stand out. And also the way it's designed is perfect for sunsets, sunrise, sun, sunrises. This photo I did not take. I could have. The house was there for years. I thought it was a house that was not there during the battle. It wasn't a historic house. Obviously, it doesn't look historic at the time. So I ignored it. And a few years ago, the Park Service bought the house, and they did restore it. This is the Warfield house. And this is the way it looks today. And this is the way it was um, much earlier. And uh, they added on after the house, as they did in a lot of buildings around Gaysburg, they've added on to them. But this one, they non-historically add on, they were able to take it back the way it looked in 1863. And this is from Seminary Ridge, or start of Warfield Ridge. And it's looking across the cornfields to the wheat field, wheat field, peach orchards, apologize. So this is the peach orchards. You can tell when Sickles moved his men up, he was looking for the high ground. And the peach orchard very much is the high ground. Um, you can see the Confederate troops had to come down and up to attack the peach orchard. It was a very good position if he would have had two corps instead of one. Sickles did not have the manpower to be able to to protect the, the line he, he adopted for his board. Uh, and this is from Little Round Top, looking to the west. And you can see, the, if you're familiar with the, the boulders, this is the end of Devil's Den. And, um, and this is what it looked like when I first got to Gettysburg. I mean, you look at the sign, for example, for Robertson's Brigade, and you were looking right behind nothing but trees. There was no way to tell what happened on the second day at Gettysburg on the Devil's Den. And this is what it looks like after they did all the tree clearing to open up the ground. And uh, it makes a huge difference. Most of the Devil's Den was taken by Benning's brigade and they just came up the other side of the brigade. Now there was a lot of fighting through here. Plum Run runs along through here, it was called Bloody Run, because all the troops that were killed trying to get past Devil's Den up to Little Round Top or turn and attack Devil's Den. And this is the view from the west looking up towards Devil's Den. And this is the path that Benning's Brigade went. Benning's Brigade, when they got up there and they took Devil's Den, they stopped. Um, I'm not sure if the commander ever got above the hill to be able to see Little Round Top. But from here, you can't even tell there was another hill behind him with Union troops on it. This is near Plum Run, giving you an idea of how rocky it was. And this same same for here, looking up towards uh, Devil's Den from the run. And it's just, uh, yeah, it's that steep a climb too. This is Triangle Field, what used to be called a Triangle Field. It was supposed to be the most haunted place on Gettysburg. Um, not that I have any experience with too many ghosts on Gettysburg. I have had some experience, but that's for an another presentation. Uh, after they did the tree clearing, uh, it never, no longer was a Triangle Field because the, the woods that made it into a triangle were just cleared out. This is closer to the way it looked in 1863. Uh, this photo of Devil's Den I took with as a slide. Uh, this was taken in about 1986. And uh, more modern shot of it today. This is closer to what it looks like today. They just came through and tried to identify through photos where there were trees, where there weren't, um, and what the ground looked like. At the time of the battle, this area was, you know, grazing land. Uh, a lot of this area was rocky. They had have cattle or sheep. And grazing animals took care of the underbrush. And uh, same with the woods. The woods at Gettysburg, most of them were managed woodlots. They were fenced. So the animals were behind the fence in the woods. And they would eat the underbrush in the, in the woods. 
And then today, without that, you can't really get the sight lines of Gettysburg going through the woods, what they would see because there's so much underbrush. This is Smith's Battery. It was on the end of Devil's Den. Uh, some of the Texas Brigade uh, from up on Warfield Ridge had some experience with them because one of their artillery sat up in front of the Texas Brigade that was hidden in the woods. And of course, Smith's Battery opened fire and exchanged artillery with the uh, Confederate uh, artillery in front of the Texas Brigade. And to the Texas Brigade, this looked like a volcano with all the artillery firing off the hill. And they are also yelling at the artillery to move because a lot of these shells would go long into the Texas Brigade where the, the uh, artillery unit here did no idea that the woods were full of Confederates at that time. You might have seen the famous photograph of the sh sharpshooter uh, who wasn't a sharpshooter. The body was moved to make the photograph and you can kind of get into that spot today. And this is some of the front. The Devil's Den is a volcanic, um, not a volcano, but volcanic rocks that developed in the magma and pushed itself up. Uh, this is the fourth main. They were on the backside, on the eastern side of Devil's Den. And I'm showing this picture not for anything they did, but just the colors. You know, catching it in the golden hour in the afternoon just uh, makes it. Colors that I enjoy. I hope you do too. Uh, this is Warren up on Little Round Top. Governor Warren was sent by General Meade to look at the hill that was Meade was surprised with on nobody on it. And out to the far left, uh, Warren looked out there and saw that it was an opening. And he was worried about the Confederates getting past uh, the units on Devil's Den. Uh, he sent a rider, one of his aides, down to get um, one of the artillery guns on Smith's battery to fire far to the left, and they did that. And Warren said he saw a streak of light. He doesn't know exactly what it was. He assumed it was uh, gun barrels as the Confederate troops pointed in this direction and uh, realized that Devil's Den was going to be uh, flanked, and he called for troops. Um, Vincent's brigade was the first that came up and Vincent's brigade got up, came up a different route than Warren did. Warren didn't even know they were on the hill and Warren kept sending for troops expecting because he didn't realize Vincent had already gotten troops up, but they, they, Vincent took them to the South side of the hill and they were down a little bit on off the summit and Warren just couldn't see him. And with all the noise around Warren couldn't hear him either. And Little Round Top is one of the most favorite places to do uh, sunsets just because it just, there's nothing there but the South Mountain in, in front of you. Uh, this is one of the guns that represents Hazlitt's battery. And if you get down low, it also provides a pretty good sunset. This is the right flank of the 20th Maine. Um, I became fascinated with 20th Maine when I wrote Red Killer Angels. Fell in love with the story of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. And when I came here first time in fall of 1986, um, climbed down there to the monument, and I wanted to know what happened. I wanted, really wanted to know who the Confederate officer was that Chamberlain captured. And it took me five years to put together a story, Robert Wicker, junior second lieutenant in Company L, 15th Alabama. So I wrote um, Killers, uh, Courage on a Little Round Top. And as my novel, it's on Amazon. And uh, it took me 15 years to get published because, you know, I had a pretty good story, but I had no idea how to write. And it took me a long time to, to write it well enough that some people enjoy it. Uh, had some good reviews couple bad, but mostly good reviews. And this is the 20th Main Monument. Chamberlain became so popular, especially with the movie Gettysburg. Some of the guides at Gettysburg just got tired of listening about Chamberlain. And the story started going around that Chamberlain was hated by his men as being a blowhard 
and he grabbed up all the publicity and they left his name off the monument. Now they could say that because very few people would go to the backside of the monument, hang over the, the rock to read that starts off Colonel Lawrence Joshua Chamberlain, uh, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. You know, what is his name? He was actually born Lawrence Joshua Chamberlain uh, for Colonel Captain Lawrence of the Chesapeake of Do Not Give Up the Ship. And his father and his grandfather were Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. And so later in life, he changed his name to Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain to match up. Uh, the family still called him Lawrence. Uh, this is the left flank marker uh, for the 20th Maine. And we talk about dedication of the battlefield and preservation of the battlefield. Um, that wasn't always the case, especially with the veterans who were there, uh, because they blew up part of this hill. Uh, and they blew it up to build this road. Now, the Park Service has recently put asphalt over it, but this was an historic road, Chamberlain Road, that the Parks, uh, the Battlefield Commission built so that older soldiers could see this part of the battlefield. And they actually blew up part of Little Round Top to get this. Um, now, to be outdone, the Army, in preparation for World War I, uh, did a tank uh, training grounds, Camp Colt, uh, in close to the town of Gettysburg, and they would use battlefield for training, and they also fired rounds at Little Round Top. Uh, this is a view from Little Round Top looking at some of the Union positions on Cemetery Ridge. Uh, this is a week George Weaker farm. Um, down here, is the Lister farm, that's the barn, and the house is uh, behind, right here's the house. That was Lee's head, uh, Meade's headquarters. And coming up, uh, this is the first Minnesota monument, first Pennsylvania memorial. If you're going to Gettysburg, keep in mind that this is an observation deck uh, on the Pennsylvania memorial, gives you a good view. And this is the second Vermont Brigade. I'm going to talk a little bit about second Vermont Brigade. It's one of my favorite brigades at Gettysburg. And then this is the Bryan House. Uh, Cults of Trees is right here. This is the uh, bachelor um, coined the phrase, the high tide of the Confederacy. Uh, this right here is the auxiliary monument to the New York, state of New York. They also have one up in the National Cemetery. They're the only state that has two monuments. Uh, this is, is the wheat field, and wheat field, when I was reading books about it, I, I missed the part where the wheat field is built on a hill, uh, planted on a hill. Uh, to the right is Stony Hill. Um, if you see on Gettysburg maps, auto map, it's got the called the loop, the way the road runs up and through it. And of course, Rose Woods is on the other side. The Rose family owned the wheat field as well as the woods. And uh, it, a lot of the fighting going up and down with up and down the hill. This is Peach Orchard. There are two two observate three observation towers. Well, one of them's pretty short. On Oak Hill, there Oak Ridge, there's one, and this one is at Longstreet's headquarters, uh, second day headquarters, and then there's also one on Culp's Hill. This is the one that has the best view, and this is a view of the Peach Orchard. Um, many years ago, the trees in the peach orchard were in bad shape. They were infected. Park Service took them all out. They left them out for a couple of years. Then they replanted the peach orchard, uh, completely redid it. And when they did, it, did it that, they also expanded it across the road, uh, the Wheatfield Road or Miller's Road, and uh, also behind the little the hill part of the peach orchard on the downslope. And this is what it looked like when the trees were being, after they were planted and starting to grow. And this is what it looks like today. So it, it took them about 10 years for the trees to get up and they are bearing fruit. I'm not sure if they, what they do, keep, you know, how well they treat the trees for process of bearing fruit, but I've seen fruit on the trees. 
This is the Excelsior Brigade monument, another one that was taken during Golden Hour. And uh, this is the, the brigade that Sickles, Dan Sickles, organized. And this is the 73rd New York. Um, it was part of the Excelsior Brigade, and it recruited a lot of firemen, New York firemen, to join this particular regiment. And this monument, where it's placed, gives you an excellent chance to, to do evening photographs, gets you a lot of color in the sky. Um, and this is sunset, and then this is sunrise. This is the Kinkler House. Um, way it looked when I first went there, uh, it was just bad shape, not very historical. Uh, the Park Service redid it. Unfortunately, I've re read recently, the paint that they used in 2010, the paint it uh, trapped in moisture. And the logs that this log house is starting to rot. And I'm not sure what the Park Service is going to do to um, take care of it and restore it. Hopefully they don't lose the house. Uh, this is Trossel Barn. Uh, you might have seen the famous photo of the artillery shell that still had the hole is still there all these years later. I picked this picture because this is the only monument to Dan Sickles on the battlefield. And this is the one that where he uh, was shot from his horse and wounded and lost his leg. Another view, of the, this was taken from the Wheatfield Road, uh, looking across. Uh, the monument in the background is to the U.S. regulars. Uh, the regulars uh, were a brigade uh, in the uh, Fifth Corps, and they were involved in the fight on Hope's Ridge, um, which is an extension of Devil's Den. U.S. Adel Avenue goes by the Trossel Farm. And it cuts over to the left, a sharp left turn, and then a sharp right turn to go up to Cemetery Ridge. Um, the Park Service, though, the original farm lane just went straight. And what the Park Service has done is restored that farm lane back the way it looked in 1863. There wasn't a lot of action in this part of the battlefield, but the, the lane really, walking that lane really brings you back in time. At least it does for me. This is the first Minnesota. This is one of three monuments of the first Minnesota. They have one for the second day for their famous charge. Um, when I first came here to Gettysburg before they had removed the trees, so it was just a line of trees. You could not tell why they advanced anywhere because it was just a woods in front of them. Couldn't see through the woods at all. Once they cleared it out, it really shows up well. Uh, there's another one they were involved on the third day uh, on Cemetery Ridge, there's a smaller monument to there. And then there's another monument, one of the first monuments put in Gettysburg in the National Cemetery. And of course, this one, just like any of the others I've liked, uh, there's a lot of places to do good sunsets in Gettysburg. Uh, this is one of my favorites, my wife's favorite. Um, the sun had just set, didn't look like anything was going to happen. Colors were terrible. I knew there was a storm coming in. I was tired. This was our last day. I told her I wanted to go. And she goes, just wait 10 minutes. And that 10-minute wait got me this. Um, my wife likes to go to, used to like to go to the battlefields with me. Uh, she would drop me off. I would walk the battlefield. She'd go find a place to park under a tree, read romance novels, and watch the animals go by. At the time, there's still quite a few deer on the battlefield. They've thinned the deer crowd, deer herd out quite a bit. They'll see some, but not like there was um, in the 90s. And that's the, uh, of course, first Minnesota and then Pennsylvania Memorial. And Pennsylvania Memorial, this is the golden hour in the evening. And anything that's white gets a very good hue to it. Um, this photo took me hours to get because there were people on the, the rooftop of the Pennsylvania Memorial. There are people in the front of it. There were cars parked along there. 
there are people on Little Round Top. There's a Little Round Top in the background. And I just had took a lot of time to take them out and not be noticeable that I took them out. This was an early morning shot. So this is on East Confederate Avenue. It runs from town uh, along the backside of Culp's Hill. And, you know, for a long time, you couldn't see much. And this, when I went, the year I went here, uh, obviously couldn't see a whole lot, but I knew they were working. And a couple of years later, when I came back, this is the view that I came back to. And this is a view from the low ground, just um, to the north of Culp's Hill, looking up towards Cemetery Hill, and of course, the gate house at the Evergreen Cemetery. Uh, 123rd New York Infantry. I just like the monument. Uh, it was an afternoon where I took it. Um, just, I like it. Sometimes you need to take a picture, in whether it's famous or not. For those people who study 123rd New York, I'm sure it's famous to them. Not so much for me, not part of my interest, but I just like the monument. First uh, Regiment Eastern Shore, Maryland. Uh, on Culp's Hill, there's also a monument to a Confederate Maryland regiment. Um, this one's in the afternoon. Hard to get in Culp's Hill to get a picture like this because of all the trees. And I just happened to catch the light right. Uh, the camera set up to make sure that the light was good on the monument. That meant the rest of it goes dark and uh, just make the monument more dramatic. This Forbes Rock, um, they recently gone through and cleared out parts of Culp's Hill. So you get a better idea of what it looked like instead of just looking into a dense woods that you couldn't see anything at all. The artist, when he did the painting uh, sketch with Forbes Rock, it was easy to see all the way up to the summit. Uh, that's because the cult family had their animals there um, during, especially during the time of the war. And uh, that's they kept their animals in the woodlots. And that way, all the underbrush was cleared out. This is looking from the summit of East Cemetery Hill. Cemetery Hill is huge. This is on the east side. And uh, this is early, obviously, early morning. Might not be obvious, early morning. And then the colors just worked out well for me. Uh, in the background, this is Stevens Knoll. This is Stevens Battery. And the statue for General Sulcum, his headquarters was on that knoll. His statue is up in the trees. And this is looking up to Culp's Hill. That's General Hancock. Sometimes when you're taking the picture, you can use the trees to kind of highlight and extenuate the uh, subject you're, you're photographing. Hancock again. And this is Evergreen Gatehouse. They added on the section to the right after the war. And the porch area that wasn't there during, during the battle. This is Elizabeth Thorne. Her husband was a, the cemetery um, gatekeeper, and he was away at war. She was not. And after the battle, there were a lot of dead bodies on Cemetery Hill and in the cemetery itself. And the regents of the cemetery came to her and said they wanted the buried bodies buried. And as pregnant as she was, her and her father and then one other helper buried 93 bodies. And they didn't buy, bury just Union bodies. There are some Confederate bodies buried in Evergreen Cemetery. And this is um, Howard on Cemetery Hill. And I have this photo to show you what you can do with the different monuments or different objects in, in the, their features and how you can just move them around a little bit by changing your position and get different views of the sky or the monuments themselves if you want to do a silhouette. Howard wasn't his, you know, he wasn't one of the leading generals at Gettysburg, 
but he's one of the best ones for taking the sil sunset silhouette. This monument here is to General Hancock, where he fell during the battle on the third day during Pickett's Charge. Uh, he was wounded, and he was over with the 2nd Vermont Brigade. 2nd Vermont Brigade was a nine-month regiment. Um, they were organized at the time when President Lincoln called for troops because the Confederates were invading towards Maryland and Antietam. Um, and they had not seen any action. They had been in the guarding supply trains, guarding railroads, guarding uh, telegraph lines. They saw no action. Two days after the First Corps went by them, they were assigned to the First Corps and they almost caught up. Um, of course, by the time they got there, General Reynolds was dead. The First Corps was just decimated. And so they were assigned in the Arion Cemetery Ridge um, with Second Corps and General Hancock um, came their commanding officer. This was the only battle that the 13th Vermont was in. They were just charged a couple of weeks later. And this is the monument, the Vermont monument to both, both um, first and second Vermont brigades were at Gettysburg. Second was in the sixth corps and didn't see any action. And again, little round top shows up and big round top does also. Uh, this is Stephen Brown. He is on the statue of the 13th Vermont. He was a uh, first lieutenant in Company K, and uh, they stopped for water, stopped for a rest period near Frederick, Maryland, and they were told not to break formation. His men were running out of water. Uh, a lot of them looked like they were going to pass out. He Brown gathered the largest man in the regiment and gathered all the canteens he could from his company anybody didn't have water, and they went towards the well. There was a Confederate, uh, Confederate, an infantry cavalry officer, might have been, might as well have been a Confederate, guarding the well, told Brown he couldn't get water there. Brown told him he loved him like a brother, and he, he could go, to two choices, go reporting, as again, breaking the uh, orders, or he could stay and die. The Confederate, the officer, cavalry sergeant, uh, rode away, and when time Brown got back to the regiment, he was under arrest and they took away his sword. He went into the Battle of Gettysburg with a hatchet. Um, after the war, uh, Brown also served in the 20th uh, Vermont. Uh, he was in one battle at Wilderness where he lost his right arm. Uh, but after the war, when it came time to put a monument up to the 13th, uh, they chose Brown to be on the monument. Uh, they have him holding the Confederate officer's sword that he took during Pickett's charge. Confederate officer told him he wasn't going to surrender his sword to him because he was just a lieutenant. Brown raised up the hatchet, and the officer changed his mind. The regiment wanted Brown holding the hatchet, uh, but Battlefield Commission thought it wasn't dignified, so they let him hold the sword he captured, and then the sword, the hatchet is at his right foot. When I was uh, there, a better view of it, held the phone up high, was able to get that picture. When I was looking for um, a union officer for my second book, Courage on Cemetery Ridge, I had for Confederate, I picked Jacob Turney was in the first Tennessee. Um, he had fought in the first day's morning attack. I uh, was in rest on the second day and was involved in Pickett's charge. And John Heiser was historian at the time at the battlefield. Gettysburg, I asked him, who would he pick for a union officer? And he told me about Stephen Brown. And that's why I picked Brown. And I write the story about the two of them and their experiences at Gettysburg. Uh, this is General Gibbons uh, of the Second Corps. And the Cemetery Ridge is a great place for sunrises and sunsets. Uh, this is a monument to Wright's Brigade. They, on the second day, almost broke through the Union lines. They got pretty close. Lee saw that, and that part of the influenced him to do pick his charge on the third day. And that's the Culps of Hill. Uh, this is the angle, uh, the stone wall, and this was the uh, area of the high tide of the Confederacy. And this is the monument at, Culps, uh, at the Culps of, Culps of Trees. 
General Meade, not to be outdone with General Lee. And Meade makes a interesting sun or late sunset, sun, late days photograph. Uh, this is the second um, Pennsylvania Cavalry. And now why they're doing dismounted, I'm not sure. Uh, but he's down the hill a little bit on the backside of the hill. And it was just a just a good place to do sunset pictures of him and, and Meade together. This is Lister Farm. Um, it was on the backside of Cemetery Ridge. So Meade got notice from Little Round Top that 15,000 Confederates were hammering down the Fairfield Road heading towards the north. Um, I found that it's in the or official records of the, of the war. Uh, you can read what was written to him. And it seems to me the reason why Meade didn't check out the lines towards the south was he expected troops on the north. As if he would have walked up the hill up here to Cemetery Ridge, which wasn't very far away, he would have seen that Sickles was not where he thought he was. That's Lister House. Uh, Lydia Lister was a widow. Um, her and her kids lived in this house after the battle. She had a lot of dead artillery horses on her property. Um, no one to help her. So she was very um, productive. She gathered up the horses' bodies and burnt them. And he collected all the ash and sold it for fertilizer. Another view of the house with meat up on the hill. And I'm going long. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, if you can go maybe uh, yeah, maybe five or ten more minutes would be great. Okay. So, thank uh, you. This is Courty House. It was in the middle of Pickett's Charge. This is what the house looked in, like in 1863. The extension was built back here after the war. Uh, the big red barn you'll see uh, if you go to Gettysburg was a barn that was built, added to after the war. The barn in 1863 was much smaller. This is 72nd uh, Pennsylvania Monuments, both of them. Uh, the first one was built, put up where the Battlefield Commission said it, they could put it up, where they went into line of battle. They were held in reserve. Um, at the climax of Pickett's Charge, they ran forward and fought at the Stone Wall, and they wanted their monument Stone Wall. Battlefield Commission said no, so they put their monument here up in towards the back, then they took the Battlefield Commission to court and went all the way up to Pennsylvania Supreme Court. And then they got their second monument up at the stone wall. Court agreed with them. And that's the Virginia monument in the background. And this kind of speaks for itself. It just. This is part of Cushing's battery. And this is Cushing's battery also, 4th U.S. artillery. Early morning, great time to catch at Gettysburg ground fog. And these are our batteries along the stone wall, just a little north of where Cushing's battery was. Brian's bar, uh, house. And this is the National Cemetery. And the Soldier of Monument. And this is the uh, first Minnesota, actually state of Minnesota monument. And this was put in the battlefield. Um, one of the first monuments on the field at Gettysburg. And this is right where the uh, all the dead are from Minnesota 
and all the dead from Minnesota were with the first Minnesota. Well, thank you very much, all of you, for hanging with me. Um, that's it. I really appreciate your time. Anybody have any questions? Hey, thank you, Tom. Appreciate yeah, it. This is excellent. Yeah, I have uh, there's a couple of folks that have uh, sent me some questions, and uh, you may have hit on it during your presentation, but how long would it typically take for you to wait for a particular shot before you got the one that you really, really liked, especially with people in the background, which I'm sure was, was very difficult to capture with nobody in that picture. So, you know, I don't have, a, when I was traveling up from Houston up to Gettysburg, time was precious. Yeah. So I didn't have a lot of time to wait for any photos. Um, I've probably taken 12 to 13,000 pictures to get the ones you saw. So there's really no waiting for the perfect shot. You just take pictures and hope you get the good shot and you just wait through them. Um, some of the sunsets are just easy to get because not that many people are out that either early in the morning, especially early in the morning or late in the afternoon or night. Uh, the ones taking people out, um, you just sit and wait and hope they step away. You know, I've waited 15, 20 minutes sometimes for somebody to leave in front of a monument. Yeah. But and sometimes I've walked up to people and say politely, could you, would you mind stepping over for a, a 30 seconds so I take some pictures? And people are really very friendly about doing that. Yeah. Well, we have some very positive comments, Tom, as expected. Uh, what a treat, Rob says. Uh, love your love your photographs. Beautiful, photo beautiful photography from uh, from Julie. Uh, thanks very much. Very enjoyable program. Incredible photos. Uh, have you taken any, uh, uh, have you captured photographs of other battlefields that you've been around like, like Gettysburg? Yeah, not as I have not gone back to battlefields like I've gone back to Gettysburg, but I've got photos of over 24 battlefields I've been to. Okay. Um, I like taking pictures of Antietam also, you know, Gettysburg just, I've written two novels about Gettysburg. So I go back there. Yeah, I started putting get pictures on the internet, uh, my pictures on get internet, because I thought maybe people would be more attracted to my photos than to my name associated with the book. You know, because you pop a photograph up and you get instant recognition that you like it or you don't. Where a book, you got to check reviews and, and go looking for it. And I didn't know when I started writing how hard it was to get Civil War fiction published. I thought after Killer Angels, you know, other people would be able to do that, but you know, not many people are the writer that Michael Sherrall was. Yeah. Uh, or Jeff Sherrall having his father's name really helped. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it just, the other battlefields, I've done them. Um, if you look on Facebook, there's a page, Civil War Battlefields. That's mine. I have not put the, as much effort into it as it has Gettysburg. But I've got Shiloh, Stones Mountain, Antietam. Um, P Ridge, um, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, uh, and, and I've got others I've got need to add to that page. Um, and I'm for Gettysburg uh, photograph uh, Gettysburg photographs page on Facebook. I have all the tour stops and plus anything if you look at the auto tour map, they're all labeled by by the map. And I have about three thousand photographs of the battlefield.